Let's continue following our viral fascinations. And today, our goal is to think about how an animal virus enters its host cell. Once it's in there, how does it make copies of its genome? And how does it get out? Now, some viruses are far more likely than other viruses to actually want to get out of the host cell. Some of the smooth criminals just hang out within the host cell and get replicated every time the host genome gets replicated. They're very, very slick <laughs> under the radar. Um, let's start by looking at entry, but first I have a great generalized picture that shows the process, um, basically overall life cycle of an animal virus. This can be found in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And what we're seeing here is this process of entry, um, of uncoding, in which the nucleocapsid, um, the protein, the protomers of the um, capsid are uh, release the nucleic acids. Um, they can be replicated, and then this whole process of exit can occur. So this is a generalized view of this. Let's zoom in and speak about adsorption, not to be confused with absorption. Adsorption is a technical term by which a viral spike protein um, binds specifically to a host cell receptor. Remember that those host cell receptors are not there for viruses. Viruses are exploiting those receptors. Those receptors are typically there to say, for example, hear distress signals uh, that mean that the cell needs to launch an immune response or something of that nature. But the virus exploits them. It's there, it tends to be, viruses are very smooth. They're smooth criminals. So uh, many times the spike protein, one of the spike proteins of a virus binds very specifically to the host um, surface receptor and triggers something. In this particular case, this virus is triggering endocytosis, and this virus is getting in via endocytosis, where you can see that it it um, once this endosome forms, it's inside of that low pH compartment. And something about being in that low pH compartment triggers a change that allows that um, virus to fuse its membrane with the membrane of the endosome and that pops the nucleocapsid out. Now, not all envelope enveloped viruses enter this way. In fact, sometimes an enveloped virus can actually um, completely fuse its um, envelope with the cytoplasmic membrane and then boom, pop that nucleocapsid right in. So we say that enveloped viruses can either enter the host cell uh, via membrane fusion or endocytosis, and there are specific spike proteins that mediate this process. Let's just make sure that we got that all down. So envelope viruses, two options. They can enter the cell via membrane fusion. Oftentimes they have one specific spike protein. We'll see that with HIV uh, that is actually capable of mediating that fusion. Uh, we also see that with the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that allows for that fusion. So then the nucleocapsid just gets popped into the cytoplasm where it can then uncoat and the gen genetic material is free. So endocytosis, another strategy for envelope viruses getting in, that's what we saw in the prior picture where something about being in that low pH endosome then allows fusion with the endosomal membrane and then you can see the uncoating process. Naked viruses don't have these options. Naked viruses must be taken in by endocytosis um, and once they are inside of that low pH endosome, oftentimes that triggers something um, maybe it causes them to push their genome through uh, a, a basically through the membrane of the endosome and into the cytoplasm. Um, that can occur, or sometimes we see the vesicle being lysed and, and that releasing the, the um, nucleocapsid and uncoating can then occur. Let's look at a very famous smooth criminal, influenza virus. I'm gonna show you a video that was um, produced by the MOSC Biomodeling Center. It's no longer available that I can find online, so I wanna be sure to credit them. Um, they used to make 
radtastic three-dimensional printed models of, of varying things. But this uh, animation shows us really in a detailed and over-exaggerated way the entry of an influenza virus into its host respiratory cell. So let's take a look. I'm going to narrate this as we go. We're going to start by seeing the influenza virus fly across the surface of a respiratory cell. And its spike is grossly oversized. Um, there are actually two spikes in this. There's the neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin spike on the influenza virus. The neuraminidase uh, spike binds to the surface receptor. And once we're inside of the endosome, the low pH causes a conformational change in the hemagglutinin spike. And you can see the hemagglutinin now rearranging due to that low pH. You can imagine amino acids like lysine, arginine, histidine being very much protonated here. There's conformational changes and that allows for the fusion uh, it, with the endosomal membrane and boom, the nucleic acids are free in the cytoplasm. So now we notice, and maybe you really noticed, that influenza virus is segmented and remembered that it has can have many strands, um, seven or eight strands of single-stranded RNA. That's why we think about reassortment being a possibility or genetic shift in the influenza virus. So that process then of um, endocytosis followed by endosomal uh, membrane fusion is how influenza gets in. So once these uh, once these RNA or DNA or um, you know it could be double stranded or single stranded are inside of the cell, there are so many different strategies by which viruses replicate their genome. I want to talk to you about just one of those strategies. Remember the itsy bitsy tiny little parvoviruses? Well, those are kind of crazy because they have negative sense single-stranded DNA genomes. So one asks, well, how do they replicate? So I want to do a drawing. This is relatively complex. I'm going to do my best to simplify it um, to show you what goes on and to allow this single-stranded negative sense genome to copy itself and um, make you know more copies to go into daughter viruses. But of course, also to then create something that can be expressed to form mRNA and, um, of course, all of the viral proteins that are needed. So let's take a look at this. So recognize that um, the negative sense DNA means that it's a three prime to five prime single stranded DNA. This is what comes in with that naked virus, so it has to enter by uh, endocytosis. So what happens with this is we know that that um, single-stranded DNA is going to have to make double-stranded DNA in order to enable replication, right, in order to make more. But this is problematic because remember, DNA cannot replicate without a primer. So get this, parvoviruses self-prime. They do this amazing thing where they have complementary regions at each of the termini, their inverted repeats. And so it causes this thing to happen where they actually form a T from at each end. So you actually get this formation. It's like, I don't know, maybe double barbells or something where it's wrapping back upon itself. So now what you have is the three prime end there. And of course the five prime end is down here. And look at this. Oh my gosh, there's an open three prime hydroxyl and complementary DNA. So it's literally self primed. So now the, um, the complementary strand can get synthesized. And so that you're recognizing that um, red as being the newly synthesized DNA. And actually what will happen is this will keep on pushing down here and it will unravel there and it will keep on copying until the very end. So we actually end up with something that looks like this. So we still have this ends barbell 
but then this is unraveled down and the red now the new complementary strand of DNA has gone all the way down and we got our three prime then down here and so then what occurs is that the um, viral DNA is now able to encode for one of the mRNAs that encodes for an enzyme that actually cleaves this. And so what you're noticing here is that, yes, we do have a complementary strand, but it's not complete. It hasn't copied the entirety of, of the genome yet. So you get the synthesis of this enzyme that cleaves right here. And then that allows for essentially the unraveling of this end. And you have a double-stranded DNA. Um, and <laughs> nothing intended by that little lump there. Um, so this then opens up this three prime hydroxyl and complementary DNA right here. So then this forms what is almost a complete copy but it's it's not uh contiguous so what then occurs again is that we get the formation of these um, they wrap back around in the complementary regions again and we get this um double barbell look going on so let me show you what happens here this is just so elegant it is like these amazing the life quote unquote of a of dna just of how nucleic acids can form 3d structures that can enable them to do such interesting things so now you've got like this there's still these complementary regions here so you get this t formation right here and then you get the same thing here and then that opens up again um, op an open three prime hydroxyl here and it can copy the remaining section down again <laughs> so we just see this sort of circular process of self priming and copying self priming and copying and we get the replication of the dna in that way and of course in having double stranded dna um, the double stranded dna has a template and a coding strand the template strand can be used to make mrna and to synthesize viral protein so this is one of many, many strategies that viruses use to copy their DNA or RNA to allow replication of their genome. We are now primed to talk about how do virus get, viruses get out of the cell. And once they've uh, encoded for all of their proteins and they go through maturation where everything gets packaged, how do they then get out? Well, naked viruses have to lyse the host cell in some way, or they have to trigger the lysis of the host cell in some way so that they can be released. Sometimes they just simply weaken the host to such a point that the cell dies and then that enables the um, viruses to escape. Just because if a cell is weakened enough, you start to see lysosomes releasing their lytic enzymes and it's sort of a self-degradation. However, another thing that can happen is that in every nucleated cell in our body at all times, the cell is, is constantly proving itself to the immune system. It's proving whether it's self or not 
Um, and so the way that, that that happens is that a small amount of whatever protein is inside of that cell is constantly uh, uh, degraded and, and displayed. So essentially, I like to think about this as flying a flag. You, you fly a flag of what's inside of you. Think about a British ship. A British ship flies a British flag because there are British sailors in it. <laughs> this is the same in our cells. A, a lung cell flies, flies lung cell proteins because it's a lung cell. <laughs> but if it's been invaded by a virus, suddenly it's got viral proteins in there. It's kind of like a pirate ship, right? If pirates, pirates take over, over the British ship, they're going to hoist up the pirate flag. Well, this is true when a virus has infected a, a, a lung cell, it now hoists up a pirate flag. And the immune system looks at it and it says, whoa, pirates. And it the immune cells send out either signals saying destroy yourself, or they send out lytic uh, enzymes causing that self-destruction or causing that destruction of the invaded cell. So that's called the cytokine response. So we, we see then in, in the case that a host cell can't prove itself as self, it could actually be destructed on purpose. This is kind of a catch-22 because it ends up re releasing viruses. So it, again, again, virus ex exploiting the system. Now, envelope viruses commonly, as we know, leave via budding. They actually glean their uh, envelope from budding off of the surface of the host cell um, and gaining their most outer layer and their spikes that way. They, of course, have to encode for their spikes first, insert them in the cytoplasmic membrane, and then bud off. So different kinds of viruses, different kinds of strategies. And of course, that has different manifestations for infection. So we have different type, types of viral infections. There are the type of viral infection that many of us are familiar with, where you get really sick for a really short period of time. A lot of cells die, but usually in the end, you have long-lasting immu long immunity. Um, we say influenza is an example of this, and it is. If influenza never changed, if it never went un underwent genetic drift or genetic shift, um, if it never ha there were was never any mutation, we would see that we would be resistant to influenzas uh, once we had had them. But of course, they're constantly shifting and tr changing. So you do gain immunity. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not they're changing. This is actually going on with SARS-CoV-2 uh, as well, because remember we've been tracking the mutations in that, and so it's interesting to ponder when we hear the news that people are seeming to get reinfected, one possible hypothesis for that is that they're not getting reinfected with the same variant, but instead something that has changed, has mutated, um, and that they don't have long-lasting immunity too. That's just one possibility, right? One hypothesis we could put out there. So there's also persistent infections. These are the ones that we all have all the time. For example, fever blisters or herpes viruses, they're always in us. It's just that when we get too much sun or we get a little bit immunosuppressed, that's when we get a fever blister. So for the most part, these viruses may, may not, they may be very much um, dormant. They may not be causing you to express symptoms of the disease, but you are always a carrier. Now, there are a couple different types of persistent infections. There are chronic infections. These are like HIV. Um, HIV is... Um, always there. And unlike others, it's generally detectable. Um, but the symptoms may be mild or absent for very long pe periods of time, 20 years sometimes, um, that we won't see particularly strong symptoms with that. Now, eventually you will start to see symptoms. Um, and most of those are from secondary infection. Latent infections are even less, they're, they're not detectable. So the virus literally stops reproducing and it's dormant. So, you know, whereas in HIV, we talk a lot about uh, viral count. We, we talk about um, also uh, the um, concentration of immune cells that are the host cells for HIV, the CD4 cells. 
So the virus is um, generally replicating and reproducing, but that's not true, say, of herpes virus or um, remember I was mentioning varicella zoster, chickenpox, um, mono, right? All of us, many of us have ha are carriers of those. I have, I had chickenpox, so I had, I have varicella zoster virus that's there, but for the most part, it's literally stopped reproducing. It's dormant in the root ganglia, dorsal root ganglia, and it, it's not really detectable. Now, of course, if you get shingles, right, as a later expression of the disease, you can see that uh, reactivating. Now, this is another possibility. I mean, we don't know. Again, SARS-CoV-2 could be reactivating in some way, and maybe it's less of an acute infection than we think. Maybe there's some persistence. We don't know. Um, slow infections are really very unusual. Sometimes we see with a virus that typically causes an acute infection that in very rarely and in very few people, it can cause a, 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 a um, terminal, uh, n you know, neural degenerative disease called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, and, and that's always fatal. So a very interesting uh, manifestation. Now that we've kind of had this chance to talk about persistent infections, um, I would be very remiss not to um, end our semester with a talk about human immunodeficiency virus, the virus that causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Um, HIV is uh, by far, I would say, while we're mid-pandemic with SARS-CoV-2, HIV and AIDS would be the pandemic that I would still consider to define my generation. And we could think about it and maybe uh, five or 10 years from now, if we have the chance to meet, we can reflect and determine whether it might be the virus that also defines your generation. Um, it is still kill killing uh, you know, a huge number of people every year. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about statistics in your exercise today. Um, but it's a retrovirus and it's tempting to think, oh, is that because it was characterized in the 1980s? And it was. No, it's actually because it is a, an RNA virus that uses reverse transcription. So right, reverse transcription. So think for a minute, what's transcription, right? Transcription, the process by which DNA becomes RNA, it's an RNA virus that uses reverse transcription. Ah, so what does it do with that RNA? And look at that, there's the reverse transcriptase enzyme that it comes along with that catalyzes that, that reverse transcription. Um, it also comes along with an integrase enzyme. So once reverse transcription has taken place, this integrase enzyme goes to work um, to allow the virus to become a very smooth criminal. Think about what happens to it next. Um, and then protease, protease cleaves viral polyproteins to make the functional viral protein. Now, if we look at an HIV AIDS virion, um, one thing to note is here, I've sort of shown it as this static sort of conoid structure, but it wasn't until, until 2006, the six that researchers um, in England were able to characterize the structure. This is because it is pleomorphic. There's a lot of shape shifting that goes on. And so the most common structure is conoid, but there are variants. Um, notice that it does glean host-derived proteins when it buds off of the host cell. Um, its viral spikes are GP120 and GP41. We're about to see in your exercises and activities for today and, and next day that GP120 binds to the surface of the, this, the host cell. Uh, of course, those host cells are immune cells. They are dendritic cells. They are um, CD4 positive T lymphocytes, immune functioning cells. And then GP41 actually mediates membrane fusion. So keeping that in mind. Um, so I hope that you find the activity for today to be really thought provoking and please take time for it. Um, it's so important that we keep talking about viruses.